What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Don't Hold Back podcast. This is where we say it loud. My name is Nozibele Kamgana Mayaba. We aim to create a safe space for us to engage on topics that matter to us. Now, some of them may be a little bit controversial, but they are as equally as important. We do all of this with a little bit of a twist. I am a big foodie and I have asked each of my guests to come in with food that we can share in studio. Today, we are talking about managing alcohol. What is a healthy way of drinking? Now, it is no secret that South Africans la 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 love their strong drinks, okay? Every Monday when I hop on social media, there is someone that is vowing that they'll never touch alcohol again and that is after a very heavy weekend right but then listen there comes another weekend and it's the same cycle all over again so what do you do in this case and it's not only about consuming alcohol we can't deny the fact that producing alcohol is one of the most important and big industries in our country in South Africa alcohol is very much intrinsic to South Africans way of life I mean we know how we reacted to the alcohol ban during the pandemic okay so how do we have a healthy relationship with alcohol how do we manage it what is the middle ground luckily in studio we are joined by public speaker author and coach Clive van der Waren where we are going to unpack this topic further Clive welcome to the show thank you so much for making it Thank you very much for having me, you know, It's great to be here. Nice. Now, before we get into it, I did say, you know, uh, I'm a big foodie. And that is why I've asked each of my guests to bring in food. <laughs> what do you have for us today? Well, I feel a bit embarrassed if you said that you wanted, you know, as a foodie, I didn't bring in anything foodie. Okay. I brought in like... Because we're talking about alcohol, I brought in my, my go-to alcohol stuff that I used to when I was a big drinker. Oh. Knickknacks. Oh. But it had to be the real knickknacks, the not cheese knacks, not anything else, the real knickknacks. Okay. And that was my next morning hangover remedy. So I've brought that as a foodie for you to enjoy. Okay, thank you. I see also there's some sweets next to speckled it. Speckled eggs. Okay. They were my choice when I was drinking to, mm -hmm. instead of dinner, I would eat speckled eggs. So here on a platter, you have my alcohol foodie. Can I be honest? That is very unexpected. Okay. <laughs> when I got the brief for the show, I was like, oh, I'm so excited. But then also a little bit worried. I'm like, I do not drink alcohol. So please tell me that Clive is not going to bring in <laughs> some kind of alcohol or beer or anything like that that I have to try in studio. But then at the same time, I was quite excited in terms of what to expect. Um, now we're going to try um, the, the snacks a little bit later on in the show, okay. but I have to get more of the story behind them. But let's talk about you. Okay. Um, your whole career is about, you know, getting the best out of everyone. But... Let's talk about the story behind all of that. What made you get into this career? But also we are talking about, you know, managing alcohol on this episode. Is there a story behind it um, when it comes to you? Tell us about it. Okay. So I don't know how I got into this, really. I kind of fell into it, I think. Um, so I've always wanted to, to help people. That's kind of been part of my nature, I suppose, but it's quite cliched when people say that. Mm. So I, I wasn't going to go and be, you know, a, a career out of it or anything. But mo most importantly, my career has been about storytelling. I've mm. been a storyteller from I studied drama. Right. I went off to go and study journalism. I've mm. got a master's degree in journalism. So I, I went into a career in magazines was yeah. actually where I was. And after um, about 10 years in magazines, uh, and I'd kind of got quite, quite high up in management. Mm. I then sat thinking about like, what, what do I really want to do with my life? I mm. was in magazines, I was writing about things like the top 10 hairstyles for summer. And okay. I was like, I'm not sure I want to speak about this anymore. I think yeah. I want to get a bit meatier with I life. You. So yeah, mm. so I joined a training company after that. And I got involved with a bunch of industrial psychologists who spoke about using psychology in corporates yeah. to try and help leaders, to try and help people who are basically struggling with yeah. their mindset around mm. being in business. Mm. So I got into that, developed as a coach from there and launched my own business where I go in and I speak to leaders, I speak to teams about mindset, about how to deal with people, 
people properly and how to engage with each other that so that we're just enjoying our, our days together as people because I don't think corporates often do. Yes. Now, listen, you have said in your work that you enjoy the challenge of helping others, um, but you've touched on what you call a, re- a healthy relationship, you know, mm. um, with alcohol. What is a healthy relationship <laughs> with alcohol? You know why I'm saying that? It's because... When I grew up, and this is partly the reason why I never uh, wanted to try alcohol, um, there was never a healthy relationship, you know, where I come from. Um, It was either you don't drink or you drink excessively. Mm -hmm. um, And you literally see someone um, on the side of the street at 5 a.m. in the morning. So I'm very interested in, in terms of understanding what is a healthy relationship with alcohol. So a healthy relationship with alcohol is... It's easier to answer that from what is an unhealthy relationship with alcohol Mm -hmm. because an unhealthy one is any one where there's discomfort Mm. around how much you drink, what you drink, when you drink. So whatever that might be. So, you know, we we do have this picture of an alcoholic. You know, this is that's an unhealthy relationship with alcohol is is that, you know, you're falling over in the street, you you know, that excess that you're talking about. But a healthy relationship with alcohol is one where you're mindful about drinking. Mm -hmm. So what happens is is that, and it's difficult to be mindful about drinking because the problem with drinking is it gets rid of mindfulness because the more you drink, the less barrier you have to kind of saying no to to more drinking. Um, But a healthy relationship with alcohol is one where you are in a space where the relationship with alcohol isn't dictating Mm. how you behave but you operate with alcohol in a way in which it's mindful and doesn't have any kind of sense of emotional Mm. or physical attachment to you Mm. now that i'm thinking about it so i have peers where um they all believed you know um, alcohol is bad alcohol is bad but then as we progress in our careers and now that we're much older I get to interact with people now. They say, no, actually, now I I do occasionally have, you know, a glass of wine. Mm. And I'll be so taken back and never understand, is it actually a coping mechanism because of work? Um, Or it's a lifestyle that when you get to a certain stage in your life, um, it is very much, you know, accepted that you need to drink. Mm. Um, When you are in these circles, you need to have a glass of wine. Otherwise, you're going to be seen, like, differently. Mm. And that's why it's always encouraged, even with functions that are go to why i I get looked Mm -hmm. so weirdly that i don't drink so is it a lifestyle thing do you have to you know drink um what do you have to say regarding that so it's interesting because the the thing about alcohol is that it's a drug so Mm -hmm. uh, it's a toxin for the body Mm -hmm. but it's probably the only drug where when you say to people i don't want it then people say why so if I had to yeah. say to you, um, I'm off heroin for the week, I'm cleansing. I'll clap. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> you know. Whereas if I say I'm not drinking, people think I'm strange. Mm. So it is something that in terms of society, it has become a kind of sense of fun yeah. is associated with alcohol. Celebration is mm. associated with alcohol. There's all sorts of things that we associate with it. And if you're not partaking in that, it's almost like you're not part of the community because mm. the al- alcohol kind of wraps up that community that that we're a part of Mm. and that's what's difficult about giving up is because it is often then seen as you either not fun or people immediately assume that you've got a problem and they go to the alcoholic space as well but I also want to add to what you said because it's interesting is when people kind of start off when I was younger I was also very like oh alcohol is terrible Um, we would have the odd glass of wine as a family kind of thing Mm. and then I went to university and like all good university students had a great time with alcohol but it was weekend kind of partying, you know, as it went along. (laughs) Then I got into magazines um, and I was part of a wine magazine and Mm. I started judging wine and I started going to wine tastings and it did become a lifestyle. Mm. Like I loved the craft of wine. I still do. I think there's an art to wine. There's a craft to it Mm. and to whiskeys and beers and all of those kind of things. But eventually what happened in my own journey was it became something where there was an emotional attachment. I used to drive home. Okay. And I, I couldn't wait for my glass of wine. You know, I'd have like, I've had a bad day or I've had a good day. Yes. I've just had a day eventually it became and mm. I'd have a glass of wine. So what became a now and then celebratory thing became an everyday okay. occurrence. And that's what happens is that we almost, it becomes the slippery slope. Mm. And for some people, a, a bottle of wine a night isn't unhealthy for them. Yeah. It's unhealthy in terms of the medical 
uh, recommendations. Yeah. But it becomes unhealthy when there becomes an emotional dependence where eventually I, w- I was literally leaving work early okay. because I was like, I want to get home and have my glass of wine. That was all I could think about. So You yeah. know that you're saying that? I actually, I, I'm thinking of a story on social media about a particular um, you know, uh, musician mm. that came out and said they have a problem with alcohol. And people were like, oh my goodness, she drinks a lot. And as she told her story, she was like, no, um, I realized that I have a problem after I would drink like a whole bottle in one evening. And people were like, you think you're an alcohol over one bottle of wine? (laughs) (laughs) You should try uh, like two or three or four or five. Um, But now it makes sense in terms of what you're saying that it's not per per se about the the amount, but it's emotional attachment Mm. um, that for her, not having that bottle of wine was a problem, mm. right? Here's an interesting stat that I, I saw um, recently when I was you know, doing my research about this topic. It says, according to the International Society of Substance Use Professionals, alcohol remains the primary substance of abuse in South Africa. Between 7.5% and 31.5% of South Africans have an alcohol problem or are at risk of developing one. Mm. I guess when I read that, I'm like, Okay, there's no clear cut between alcoholic or being sober, right? So w- what is a high-functioning alcoholic? It's a good question. I, I suppose it's different for different people, but mm. the high-functioning alcoholic is someone who is able to pass as not a heavy drinker, mm. even though they are. Mm. So it might be... So I know, for example, I, so I, I don't call myself an alcoholic. Um, I'm a mindful drinker mm. if I do even drink. And it is very much a case of I knew I had an unhealthy relationship with alcohol. Mm. But I did. I was that it's what that stat that you said is very interesting because it's on their way to becoming an alcoholic. Mm. And that's what often a high functioning alcoholic is, is it's someone who has a dependence, whether that be physical or emotional, but it's they're still able to maintain their jobs. They're still mm. able to maintain their relationships to st- some extent. It is definitely affecting your work. Like I know if I'd have a bottle of wine the night before, even That's two what I was glasses. Gonna ask, in yeah. terms of did it change your lifestyle? How did it affect you? Well, it, when I was drinking. Yes. So when I was drinking, the next morning would obviously be terrible. You wake up and you never feel great the next morning. Mm. After two glasses of wine, some people can feel terrible. Mm. I'd built up a tolerance venture. I could finish a bottle of wine in a night and I'd be fine. Mm. Um, I would just feel a bit crappy the next mm. morning and you know have a bit of a headache and I'd wake up during the night and and you get thirsty because wine dehydrates you well alcohol dehydrates you yeah. so you wouldn't have a great night's sleep even though a lot of people think they drink wine to get them to go to sleep mm. but it actually wakes you up later it's not a it's not a it's not a narcotic that puts you out mm. so the next morning you'd feel terrible but by about 10 o'clock you start functioning as if the day is all right because it all starts wearing off but that emotional craving is almost that withdrawal. So it's not mm. the uh, alcoholic physical withdrawal. It's that emotional withdrawal that mm. your body starts going, okay. So even though the morning, I would always say, oh, I'm never drinking. Again. I've got to stop this now. Mm. I'd get home and I'd be like, oh, what's just one, one more just, you. Yeah, <laughs> what, just one tomorrow, glass? I'll start on the first, you know, I'll start on <laughs> Monday. And then, you know, it was always became something. Now that I think about it, Obviously, I can't relate to some extent because I'm not a, I'm not a, a drinker. I've never tried alcohol before. But then I understand because don't you think it's the same relationship that we have with food, mm. right? Um, every time I'm like, okay, I need to go on a diet or I need to cut some sugar. And then I see some sweet. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to try this weekend. I'm going to try on Monday, right? Mm. And then Monday comes. I'm like, well... It's not the first, so I'm going to try the first <laughs> of the month, <laughs> right? Well, it's exactly right. And mm-hmm. that's and it, it's what we were talking about before we started recording is that dopamine rush. Mm-hmm. So alcohol provides dopamine. So does sugar. So does food. I mean, that's why I love speckled eggs yeah. and things like that. So that's why the alcoholism thing is tricky. And I always say there's a spectrum of alcoholism because mm-hmm. it's exactly that. There's that emotional need for dopamine. So mm. just like we get cravings for sugar at certain times. So okay. Some people, they have patterns okay. that they get. So I know for some people at night, they want something sweet before bed or some people around lunchtime or if they feel afternoon kind of, you know, that 
that yes. when you're feeling down or you know start getting your, your bit of your slump they want they want some sugar for example but that's the brain wanting dopamine mm. and so it's exactly the same with alcohol the thing with food is that obviously food is unhealthy in your body in a certain way but alcohol is a toxin mm. so that's you know and alcohol is is also also hugely addictive yeah. as is food right. so they're both an emotional dependence which could become a physical dependence the okay. physical dependence on food obviously is quite extreme and you see the, the, those MTV shows and right. you know my 600 pound life you know but the alcoholism one is is a different kind of dependence and a different rush for dopamine. Okay. And the problem with South Africa, and I want to go back to that stat that you were talking about, is because South Africa has a hugely unhealthy relationship with yes, alcohol. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, it, it, and that was, was interesting when the pandemic struck right. and they took away alcohol and it reduced the amount of, of um, casualties right. in, in hospitals because we have such a drinking culture, which, mm. and that's the thing about alcohol, is it ripples into everything else. Mm. So it ripples into your relationships, it ripples into the, the risks you take and ripples into your working life. And it doesn't need to be to the extreme where people are collapsed the next morning. Yeah. But it's people suddenly feel like, oh, of course I can drive. Mm. Of course I, you know, or they get aggressive and don't realize they're getting aggressive yeah. and it has all these repercussions. Yeah. And so that's the thing is it starts off by us just craving this dopamine and this fun, but it eventually becomes something that emotionally we get addicted to, which eventually becomes physically addictive, just like food. Can I ask something? This is for me personally. Now, I'm more of, you know, when I taste food or when I drink, um, you know, any kind of drink, there needs to be some kind of a nice taste to it. This is me personally, right? The one other thing that I've never understood is that, okay, so someone will be like, oh, no, just try. This is sweet wine and th this is not actually bitter. You're going to like it. And what always put me off is the smell, right? And someone might say, oh, um, no, 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 it's an acquired taste. Mm. I've never, like, that's the one problem that I've had. It's similar to, like, olives. I don't like olives because of how they <laughs> taste, right? And I, I know someone that will eat the whole bottle of olives because they're like, oh, my goodness, it's like an acquired taste. They're so lovely. Is it the same with alcohol? It's just you have to get used to it. Actually, it's not nice. Mm. I, I, I've tried to understand, like, the psychology behind it. Why would you... Why would you drink something that just doesn't taste nice? Yeah, well, most people, when they first taste alcohol, don't like the taste of it. Mm. They, it will, and it has a, an immediate, like, over effect on them. You know, you it burns the yes. throat because alcohol, you know, it, it is. It's, it's an irritant yes. for the lining of the, the esophagus into the stomach. So it has all these, these kind of repercussions in the body. Mm. But it is one of those things that we're almost taught to push through. In my family, I was taught to drink from a young age. We had wine and we started off with Hanapurt wine, okay. which is sickly sweet, delicious. Okay. I mean, it's like a sweet for a child. Mm. But that was because we were taught. And it was, I mean, with no offense to my parents. I mean, yes. we knew no different. It was, you know, sophisticated. We had to learn to drink wine and okay. we had to learn to drink. But it, I don't know of anyone who has drunk wine unless it's sickly sweet and that's why the alcohol industry often adds in all of these nah, right. juices and stuff to it but right. uh, it, alcohol on its own is foul <laughs> it's certainly not a pleasant <laughs> I thought taste I was being weird no Honestly, i was like why is this putting me off the smell yeah. is putting me off i could well, like, never people who drink brandy for example you've got to hold the glass when you do brandy tastings yes. which i used to do you've got to hold the glass about 30 centimeters away from your nose okay and then pull it up to start until the alcohol burns your nose because it's so alcoholic that actually what it does is it irritates the lining of your nose. It's not a natural substance for mm. us to ingest. That doesn't mean it's not fun or it's not delicious for some or whatever it is, but it is one of those things that we do push onto people yeah. to say, even now that I don't drink, mm. when I say to people, like, I don't want to drink because it doesn't make me feel good, mm. they're like, oh, you just need to get drinking fit again. Mm. And I'm like, no. anything that you have to get fit to do that's not necessarily healthy for you. I'm not yeah. sure it's a very good dialogue in our heads. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Now, Clive, um, I want us to play a, a game, right? Um, so it ca it's called Rapid Fire. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you um, a question and you literally have like 10 seconds um, to answer it. Okay. Um, so the first question is, um, you've got two hours. Are you chilling with friends or writing? 
I am chilling with friends. Nice. Okay. Consulting a room full of high-powered businessmen or ordinary people? Ordinary people. Okay. Uh, favorite TV show or Netflix series? I can only say what I'm watching at the moment, which is The Boys on Amazon Prime. Oh, I'm going to try that. I don't, I don't know it. So good. Is so it? It's awfully gruesome and gory, but for all the right reasons. Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> listen, December in Cape Town or Johannesburg? I think I know the answer to this. December in Cape Town. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> um, a park or a clothing range named after you? A clothing range. Nah, yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like being clothed on people's skins. Is that Yay! weird? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that explanation. Right. Um, after a tough day at work, what's your choice for a pick up treat? A pick me up treat. Uh, oh, what's a choice for a pick me up treat? It would probably actually be ice cream. Oh, what's your favorite um, um flavor? Oh, I love that Gino Janelli double toffee. Huh? See, I'm even specific. I even know. It's not like I do it often. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now listen, that was really quick. On a more serious note, how do we become better role models to our peers, um, you know, in, in terms of drinking? So I think the first thing has to be with people who are drinking is stop asking people who aren't drinking why mm. and pressurizing them into drink because that says more about you okay. and your embarrassment of drinking. Because mm. I'm when I don't drink and you are, the reason you want me to drink is you actually feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm making you look bad yeah. in your mind because mm. everyone knows that drinking, having a glass of wine could be fine, but getting horribly drunk is not is not attractive. Yeah. It's not nice. We mock people afterwards. We see social media videos of people falling over, all of those mm. things. So the first thing I would say is, is that normalize not drinking. So mm -hmm. if someone is not drinking, it's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. But in terms of us who are not drinking yeah. to people who are drinking, I think what we need to do is just hold up a mirror to people. So what yeah. I do is I just say to people that there is another option. Mm -hmm. that, and I don't say to people, you must get sober. I just start, I, and it's what I do in my business is I speak mindfulness. Yeah. I speak presence. I want to be present in my life. Mm -hmm. I want to savor every moment. Alcohol or too much alcohol mm. robs me of that. Yeah. And that's what I say to people is, do you want to be present? Because so often alcohol is about escaping the present. Right. It's about wanting to step away from it. And I think what people need to do is start assessing how present they want to be mm. in their lives. And look at not just alcohol, what else is there? Whether it's PlayStation, whether it's playing golf, whether yeah. it's watching TV and Netflix or whatever, binging, whatever it is, whatever's not making you present reassess in your life mm. start looking at what could possibly be unhealthy from from that kind of stance do you think there is um there are double standards between how we see men drinking and how we see women drinking um because i've also um seen or heard different debates around about you know when there's a woman that's drinking um whiskey it's considered a very manly thing to do. Mm. You can't have women really taking a liking on whiskey. Mm. So when it comes to drinking, are there double standards? Absolutely. But it's, that's, it's a very interesting discussion that you're bringing up, and I could talk about this for a while. Mm. But the alcohol was men's terrain. Yeah. So when I was growing up, and I'm heading towards being 50 now, and mm. when I was growing up, alcohol was for men. You know, women, you could have a bit of glass of sweet wine, okay. you know, but it was the men used to drink beer and all of those things. And the alcohol industry went actively after mm. women drinkers. And they went after, but they made w drink yeah. for women. So, you know, the brutal fruits and yeah. the sweeter stuff became mm. for women. So there is still the stigma, t the stigma around kind of what you drink that there's certain terrain is for women and certain terrain for men it's being lessened even more so mm. but if i can also bring in in terms of what i saw from working in magazines is i actively saw in south africa the alcohol industry go after black drinkers mm. because especially the sorry wine industry mm. because wine wasn't it wasn't. It, it wasn't really a, a, a drink of choice for black yes, people. Beer was only beer, correct. Um, back in you know, kind of early nineties or in correct. the nineties around there. And they started hosting things like the Soweto Wine Festival. Mm. And then it became a thing that my black friends were starting to drink sweet wine. Okay. But now it's become a thing that wine is seen as this prestige to drink, champagne, yeah. you know, and often we'll go out and it's the best champagne that can be there. But there's been an active 
an active marketing to try and get people who wouldn't normally drink certain drinks to drink yeah. them. And that's yeah. been women, various communities in South Africa. It really has been quite targeted. Mm. The marketing around alcohol is massively impressive. And that's why there's been so, ma- so many um, fights to keep alcohol mm. advertising um, because it is such so lucrative mm. for the publications and press out there. Last question for my side as we wrap up the the topic, Clive. Um, Just three things, Um, just as a checklist for for someone that is listening to this episode and thinking, well, I don't have a problem. Um, I have a healthy relationship with with alcohol. I can manage it. What would you say, just a checklist in terms of um, if you can just consider these things um, and start thinking about your own relationship with Mm. alcohol and start reevaluating whether you have a problem or not, um, what will be those three things? So I would say the first thing is the medical advice in terms of alcohol Mm. is is that you shouldn't be drinking more than a bottle and a half a week of wine. Um, and obviously that what that equates to in terms of beer, so it's about two beers in a week Mm. um, or three beers in a week and then whiskey to obviously, you know, kind of a, a third of a bottle. So if you're drinking more than that, you are stepping into unhealthy territory. Okay. So that's just in terms of physically being unhealthy. Mm. Then if I had to say to you, can you quit a day in a week, a week in a month? A weekend as well. <laughs> a weekend, yes. Yeah, choose a weekend. Yeah. So a week, a week, so a Saturday. Yes. A week in, uh, sorry, a day in a week, a week in a month, and a month in a year. Wow. If I say that to you, that that's what you need to do, and that creates a sense of dread or a bit of worry of, can I do that? Mm. You potentially have an unhealthy relationship with alcohol. Mm. That's a very easy, I mean, it, we, there's many other ways. It's in terms of if emotionally, yeah. you know, there's obviously, if, you, if you're getting the shakes in the morning, you've yeah. got a problem, you know. But if you are pretty much getting home and salivating for that glass of wine or your beer, you might be, you know, developing something unhealthy. Let's get into, um, you know, my food tasting or snack tasting. Um, going back to what you said, what is it about uh, the, the the chips or the knickknacks? Tell you what, usually, now this is for me following, you know, people on social media. They always say the the best thing to cure a hangover um, is like uh, chicken licking. Mm. with like extra, extra spicy sauce and apparently that's good enough. But you lean towards knickknacks? Yeah. <laughs> like, was it the flavor? What so, was going on? Do you know, they actually serve the same function as what chicken licken does. What so, is it? So it, most people actually say also cream soda, which is it's called the green mamba. So that's when okay. I know I, I w- was with an Uber driver and she was saying that every night when like when the kids finish party, yes. and she has to drive them to McDonald's to go and get cream soda and chicken nuggets. So, but also chicken, lickens, huge, all of those things. But it's because they're greasy. Oh. So what happens is your 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 stomach you has been, it, there's an irritant in your stomach and what eases the irritation is the oil. Okay. So even with knickknacks, they're oily and it's also quite high in carbohydrates. So even chicken, licken, you know, the sauce, uh, you know, is sugary, you know, you've got all of those things. Okay. So people often want the chips with it as well because that gre- that's why they say have a greasy breakfast the I next morning. You. Because it, they think it absorbs the alcohol, but it doesn't. All it does is it just stops the irritation that's happened mm-hmm. in the in the lining of the stomach and the esophagus, etc. And then while you're drinking, you said you, you, you liked the sprinkled <laughs> eggs. Was yeah. it the sugar? I don't know. I think it, it was just weird. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, but I would go home and sometimes I would buy one, a really big packet, like, a, you know, a party pack. Yes. <laughs> it's meant to be for a party of 30. Yeah. No, I would finish no. them all by myself. No. And okay. then the next day I'd be like, I must stop drinking. I must stop speckled eggs. Which one am I going to pick? <laughs> <laughs> okay, listen, I try to be off sugar, but then I have an excuse because I'm hosting the show. I need to try. Okay. Yes, <laughs> the, yeah. The speckled eggs. No I'm going to try this. No judgment. Okay. Yes. I'm going to try the speckled eggs, maybe two or three or four or five. <laughs> <laughs> and then just a handful, you know, of just a little bit of the knickknacks. Let me do that now. Are you going to try with me? I will try with you. Okay, yes. Let's do okay, it. fantastic. Because I knew you said you were afraid, um, or y- you you got off, you know, the sweets and the and the and the and the knickknacks. But yes. today you're gonna try. I will try. So I got off all of those, and I got off alcohol. And when I got off alcohol, yes. I stopped eating these, and I lost 
quite a bit of weight. Nice. So that's why I haven't gone. So this is the first time I'm actually going to have a speckled egg since my drinking days. <gasps> no. So we're going we're gonna to break through now. And how many years now. is this? So it's been about two years now. <gasps> so yeah. Two years since I decided to stop drinking. I'd, I'd kind of lessened drinking. Okay. And then two years since I stopped drinking. I always say it's been two years since I've been sober, but I have had a glass of wine since yes. then. But it's been a mindful choice to have yeah. a glass of wine. But yeah. it's not It's not something that I... Because I, I don't necessarily want to advocate to people and say to you, you must stop drinking. It's yes. terrible. yeah. But I do think you need to assess your relationship with alcohol is what I'm all about. Okay. So let's eat the let's, speckled let's eggs. Let's do this. Let's do this. I'm going to try the, the knickknacks first. My oh. word. Probably this as this podcast, it's gonna, you're going to sound like those ladies yes. who do the <laughs> <laughs> scratching the on the mic. Well. Yes, yeah. I've tasted the knickknacks. It's really good. I'm trying not to go for the second one. Okay. And guys, wow, it's so they rich. are delicious. They are, and they're so fresh. Mm. Okay. Let me try the, the speckled eggs now. Mm. And you even get, for, for those of you who are listening, you now get vegan speckled eggs in no, case you are, really? are worried. Yeah, they are so good. Do you taste the difference though? But I, because I never understood Mm-mm. this vegan thing. No, you don't taste the difference at all. Okay, that's good. Mm. I'm going to go in and try them out. Mm. Okay, let's go. Oh, have... deliciousness. I know, right? <laughs> How does it feel after two years? Now I need a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Listen. I can feel the calories <laughs> sitting on right on my belly. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's going straight to a place that I did not want it to go to, but it's yes. okay. <laughs> okay, Clive, this has been an eye-opener for me. I've learned so much. Thank you for, for coming through, sharing your own story, sharing um, you know your own experience. Um, once again, I know, I know for a fact that this is going to bring about a lot of debate, you know, on social media. When you said, you know, um, if you start uh, drinking, you know, two beers or three beers, I thought you were going to say a day, but you just said a week. A week, yeah. Well, we're going to see what people say on social media. (laughs) (laughs) And that's over a week, not in one night, you know, so that's the thing, because that's binge drinking. So, yes. I am looking forward to you engaging on social media. What do you think about what Clive is saying? Okay, do you have a problem? Do you have a healthy relationship with alcohol? Yeah, just let us know your own experience about anyone, you know, um, even in your circle. It doesn't even have to be about you. But this is where we live it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the Don't Hold Back podcast where we say it loud. A partnership with Daicha Vela, Jacaranda FM and East Coast Radio. Please catch this episode and many other episodes um, on wherever you get your podcast uh, and also on our YouTube channel. Channel. Um, this is Nozibele Kamgana Mayaba. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, bye. Don't hold back, say it loud. Say it loud.